Hey, everyone. So happy to have a chance to be here and to host this webinar on securing digital healthcare. Uh, first of all, I'm Andrew Davis. I'm the Chief Product Officer of uh, AutoRabbit, but I'm enormously grateful to have with me here. I'm really, really excited to introduce to you Josh Corman. Um, Joshua Corman is the founder of I Am the Cavalry, and he'll say a few words about what that is. I Am the Cavalry, a grassroots organization focused on the intersection of digital security, public safety, and human life, but he's done a lot of stuff. So check out his bio on LinkedIn because it kind of on and on. He was formerly chief strategist of CISA's COVID task force. And I'll also be, he'll also be sharing a little bit about what that means. Uh, U.S. government agency CISA, their COVID task force, where he advised on the pandemic response, provided cybersecurity expertise on healthcare infrastructure, and support control systems and life safety initiatives. So prior to getting involved in CISA, Josh was the SVP and Chief Security Officer at PTC, where he accelerated cyber safety maturity across industries, uh, I think a lot of IoT work. So previously, he also served as Director of the Atlantic Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative on the Congressional Task Force for healthcare industry, cybersecurity, and in leadership roles at Sonatype, Akamai, IBM, and the 451 group. So I am really excited to have a chance to introduce Josh here. I had been a fan of Josh's talks previously, and we, we met up again and had a chance to talk at the DevOps Enterprise Summit this fall and shared a lot of common views on things like the future of artificial intelligence, uh, the risks associated with artificial intelligence, but also just profound concern for how to secure healthcare and secure other aspects of critical infrastructure in this modern digital age. And so I want to introduce Josh and just uh, give him a chance to share some, uh, some of his point of view on this. Just as a broad context, what we'll be doing is uh, hearing from Josh on what it means to secure healthcare infrastructure. Uh, and then I'll share a little bit on security and risks on Salesforce. We'll chat a bit about that. And then we want to make sure that we've got time for you all to uh, ask questions and, uh, you know, get Josh's understanding directly. So we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So Josh, let me turn it over to you. And uh, really, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for the kind intro. I, as indicated, am Josh Corman. Let me share a subset of some of the slides uh, Andrew saw in Las Vegas at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. I'm a DevOps Enterprise Summit 1.0 guy uh, and helped Tim Kim with the Phoenix Project, but a bit of a midwife to help him finish that book. And I'm very fond of the DevOps Enterprise Summit and DevOps community. You know, took a, a slightly parallel path to work on public safety human life issues over the last decade. So with that, uh, let me jump into sharing a few remarks to help set the stage as to why Andrew thought this would be a good fit for this community. All right, so I'm the Cavalry is a decade old. We turned uh, 10 years old on August 1st of this year. In recognition that I looked high and low in the federal government and for the adults in the room, I couldn't find any. I said to some of the conscientious hackers that the Cavalry isn't coming. No one's going to fix this for us. And that's both depressing and empowering. Because if you know no one's coming, it falls to us to try to be that voice of reason, technical literacy, a helping hand. But generally speaking, I was deeply concerned about the relationship between technology and the human condition. And the idea is that our dependence on connected technology was growing a lot faster than our ability to secure it in areas affecting public safety, human life, economic, and even national security. It's We say it's wherever bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. Looking back across the last 10 years, the, the overwhelming majority of our work has been on healthcare, uh, just because we found more willing allies and more existence proofs of harm. But I want you to, for a moment, think and to contextualize this, that when we started this 10 years ago as a, a bunch of idiot altruists trying to make the world safer, we were worried about any cyber physical systems that could affect public safety, human life. It was a concept and a concern. But if you look at even while I was the chief strategist for CISA's COVID task force from 2020 uh, for an 18 month period of emergency service, in that time period, the very bottom of Maslow's hierarchy needs, the things we need to prevent us from being Lord of the Flies, the things we have to be secure on, like water, food, shelter, safety, have all been compromised uh, by overconnectivity of insecure and untrustworthy technology. We have had successful compromises of the water we drink, the food we put on our table, the oil and gas pipelines that fuel our cars, our homes, and our supply chains, the schools your children attend, the municipalities who run towns and cities, the 
federal agencies charged with national security, public safety, and even timely access to patient care with now proven mortal consequences. I repeat, proven mortal consequences. My team helped provide the first statistical proof of loss of life, and we'll show that quickly. So a lot of this build up and trust building happened well before the pandemic. Um, I was asked, uh, I was trying to lean in and learn the love language of the medical device community, of the hospital community, and they don't care about security and vulnerabilities. They don't have money or time to deal with it, I think 10 years ago. But what we did find is uh, a seminal piece of peer-reviewed academic journal, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine showed that if you have a heart attack in a U.S. marathon city, during a U.S. marathon, you have a significant elevated mortality rate within 30 days. And they attribute this to going around the runners in the running route, uh, had a 4.4 minute longer ambulance ride. And people would say, well, what does this have to do with cybersecurity, Josh? And I said, well, nothing and everything, because what we've learned is degraded and delayed care for time sensitive, latency sensitive conditions like heart, brain, and pulmonary affect mortality rates, irrespective of cause. So time matters uh, for strokes. It's called the golden hour or golden hours or one, three or four hours could be the difference between if you walk in and talk again. So time is brain. Uh, a lot of this empathy building and love language got me named to a Congressional Task Force for Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity, our report published in May of 2017 during Mother's Day weekend when Congress had their advanced copy. And many of the things we warned about were punctuated by the WannaCry virus uh, and ransomware taking out 40% of UK health capacity. Only a few weeks later, not patchy, did, a, did some damage to US. So a couple highlights just to see what the world looked like in July, uh, June of 2017. We said healthcare is in critical condition then pre-pandemic. And our top five reasons uh, is that our estimate is that out of the 7,000 hospitals in the U.S., 85% uh, of them lack a single qualified security person on staff. So they're really starting at a disadvantage. It's often a head nurse playing the role of designated information security officer. So small, medium, and rural tended to have no one. They're often defending unsupported end-of-life operating systems that are, even with a good team, would be harder to protect. These systems are often uh, XP as a best-case scenario. They're often connected to each other and reachable by the outside world. Meaningful use incentivized uh, the electronic health records could be received and transmitted. So does the systems that never designed to receive or transmit anything were now premature and overconnected to everything. Uh, vulnerabilities are not just about privacy. I know we're going to talk about PII and PHI today, but we were starting to see that these can affect patient care, like Hollywood Presbyterian shutting down patient care for a week, diverting ambulances to other facilities. When you're in an ambulance, you don't want to be stuck in LA traffic. Uh, uh, and where minutes or seconds matter. And then punctuated after the report <laughs> by WannaCry. And then the known vulnerabilities academic, epidemic, uh, a typical medical device that we surveyed had over a thousand known vulnerabilities in it. And while many will not be, and maybe even most will not be exploitable, it only takes one. So with almost no one protecting these hospitals, they're protecting older, harder to defend equipment, overconnected to each other and reachable by the outside world. A single flaw in a single device can take out patient care with those degraded, delayed access to heart, brain, and pulmonary, and a typical medical device had over a thousand ways to do it. So we knew the situation was not good. Despite this, many of these hospitals said, we are so financially constrained in the U.S. system. You know, we have maybe one to four weeks cash flow on hand. We cannot afford it, can't afford to connect it, which isn't reasonable either, but we are not in a good place. We added net new exposures to accidents and adversaries, but we didn't pay the bill for doing it carefully or responsibly, and we were on borrowed time. They didn't love that, so I changed it. I inner Stanley, and I said, with great connectivity comes great responsibility. But then the pandemic made it all worse. My friend Ben made these graphics making fun of me a little bit, but you know, it's, it's difficult to put a philosopher hacker in the federal government, but a couple visuals from some of the after-action report we did uh, to look at lessons learned from the Cisco task force. We had two missions, secure vaccine supply chains and protect hospitals. Uh, I think Andrew was taken by one of my dry ice examples. But you might all recall, it was actually around this time uh, in 2020, where we were finally getting the first emergency authorized use for Pfizer, and then subsequently Moderna. But there were seven candidates when we started Operation Warp Speed, 23 supporting actors in their supply chain that we knew needed protection from enhanced protection against accidents and adversaries. But I was given a list on my first day of 1,000 smaller suppliers. I turned it into 4,000. And then we had to prioritize which of those are the ball bearings, as I turned it uh, from you know, World War II supply chains, the small unguarded weak links that could disrupt all of the things we care about for the effort. And with that, we used a bunch of Deming 
and Toyota supply chain principles and gold rats theory of constraints. And we boil it down very quickly to 66 ball bearings that were too sensitive to fail. There was one particular small uh, manufacturer. It was the only one in the world that made this particular th thing. Three of the top candidates uh, to save millions of Americans and people internationally depended on this one sole source manufacturer. And uh, when we finally introduced ourselves, they had three IT people, zero security people, and they were all over Shodan and other places. You could have sneezed on them and had a lot more dead people. So this kind of notion of taking DevOps principles and applying them to national security and public safety was timely. Uh, I think this is the one that captured a lot of people at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. But as we thought we had could declare victory and we had Pfizer, the, the first uh, emergency authorized use to help protect our 85 year olds and older with four more comorbidities, the highest death population. We were in a bad way because we need to have the cold chain keep thing, cold things impossibly cold. In fact, ultra cold for Pfizer at the time. And we did not have enough ultra cold refrigeration in the country. So we had to revert to dry ice, dust off our old middle school and high school education and make sure that we had enough dry ice production uh, the number one way to make dry ice needs uh, raw materials, which tend to be a byproduct of petroleum enrichment for gasoline. We had record low gasoline production during the first year of the pandemic. So lots of things could go wrong. And even though we did a 50 state and you know U.S. territories survey to see, can we make sure there's enough dry ice to keep cold things and possibly cold through your arm? Uh, there was one particular state that caused us extra challenge. If you're familiar with Wardley maps, that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, it's Wisconsin. Uh, boy, did I lose a lot of uh, sleep over Wisconsin, but Wisconsin theoretically had enough dry ice, but they had contractually committed it to the export of cheese and meats for the holiday season. In fact, just yesterday, I got a shipment of meats as a gift with uh, dry ice in it, uh, rubbing it in my face. So I, uh, I have some scorn for uh, the additional risks to loss of life in Wisconsin. But similarly, let's pivot to hospitals, uh, which is most of the attendees today. When you talk to hospitals, especially under emergency situations, you know, what do we all want? HHS, uh, citizens, HDOs, or health delivery organizations want to keep people alive. How do you do that in value chain mapping? It comes down to your constraints, your caring capacity, which is a coefficient of the three S's. This is their love language, not mine. And as a cybersecurity guy and tech guy, I had to learn that these are the three S's they care about space, supplies, and staff. If you give them $5 million more, they're not going to buy security. That's not the fourth S. They're going to spend it on the constraint of space, supplies, and staff. Why? Because if you have a building with 100 beds of staff space, you don't have 100 bed capacity if you only have 80 staffed beds. And you don't have 80 bed capacity if you only have supplies for 60 of those 80 staff beds. So that's where they spend their money. Now, during the pandemic, we had record high strains on that. In fact, in certain parts of the country, we still do. And uh, those things further reduce your total available carrying capacity. So I enhance this model in two ways, given my work in cybersecurity and gold rat theory constraints and all the DevOps lessons I learned from folks, including Andrew. I looked at, it's not just keeping people alive. What are those time-sensitive, latency-sensitive uh, conditions? In fact, I'm going to show you a study in a minute on the data science we did. But we could see that at the one-year mark of the pandemic, when the U.S. had lost 500,000, half a million of our fellow citizens to COVID, we had also lost another 150,000 excess deaths from non-COVID conditions. And unlike COVID deaths, these were 25 to 44-year-olds as the fastest growing demographic. I had an inclination, and I was right, that these were time-sensitive conditions like heart, brain, and pulmonary, where minutes or hours are the difference between life and death. And when you put a latency sensitivity lens on it, it's not just having capacity, it's making sure that people have the timely access to care when they need it and where they need it or people die. The second way I enhanced this is I looked at medical technology. A nurse in a neonatal intensive care unit in 1990 could handle one to three babies safely, concurrently. The nurse to patient ratio was about one to three. Armed with technology and modern medical technology and connected technology, it is a force multiplier. A nurse now can look at 12, 15, 18 babies concurrently via remote nursing stations. So our caring capacity went up. So if medical technology is a force multiplier of staff, then the unavailability of that is a force divider. And now you had a very dangerous and unsustainable nurse to patient ratio under this duress from either ransomware or other forms of unavailability. In fact, this is exactly what happened. So on October 1st, two seminal moments happened for healthcare that have changed the liability, the regulatory, and the risk management postures for all of you and your customers. On the front page of the Wall Street Journal, we were we learned of a baby who had lost their life, a named victim, 
in a, a ransomed hospital in, in 2019 in Alabama. The baby had a complicated birthing condition, but because the ransomed hospital continued to admit patients and did not have access to imaging, they could not tell there was an umbilical cord wrapped around the baby's neck. And while the baby was successfully born in a complicated delivery in the natal, natal intensive care unit, we need a dozen or more connected technologies now to assist these nurses in the, the delivery of care. And when they are unavailable uh, to help in that care, the baby, or the patient is what suffers. So this is still going through the courts, but there's exchanges between doctors and nurses that are not too good. So they'll either lose it or settle. And this just really punctuates how dependent we become on that connected infrastructure and how costly it can be, not just in dollars or breached uh, records or fines, but in patient outcomes. Similarly, on the same day, we published the first statistical proof of loss of life in this poor report called Provide Medical Care is in Critical Condition. Without going through all of it, we had done some data science on the first one year of the pandemic independent of cybersecurity. And what we could see is that those 150,000 excess deaths had strong positive correlation to a leading indicator called ICU strain. So adult intensive care unit bed populations above 75%. Once you hit 75%, you would see 18,000 dead Americans in two weeks. If you hit 100% uh, capacity, you would see 80 thousand dead Americans depicted by this curve. So a very aggressive growth in the rate of preventable, avoidable loss of life simply from having excess ICU strain from elective procedures, from uh, uh, transferring nurses out of state, from transferring patients in state. The second way we could see loss of life uh, is uh, from ransomware. Ransomware can make it worse. So what we could see in the state of Vermont, for example, we studied in the same pandemic with the same population, adjusting for hospital type and size, the ransomed communities achieve these excess death stress levels sooner and stay there longer than their peers as resulting in columns three and four, but also even ambulance diversion and next proximal alternative care, sometimes in the neighboring state of New Hampshire where I live or Massachusetts, even further away, that additional transfer above 4.4 minutes started to elevate uh, loss of heart patients and anything over an hour started to affect outcomes for stroke. So we have acute and proximal elevated loss of life and statistical excess deaths two, four, and six weeks later that were verified by state level data. So when people start dying, Congress starts listening and political will starts forming. And I testified to the Senate last May, uh, which ultimately resulted in the Patch Act uh, passing into law, which granted mandatory minimum cybersecurity for medical devices. And now they're considering what they're going to do for mandatory minimum hygiene for hospitals themselves. So back to Maslow's, we don't want to mess with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when everything in critical infrastructure is critical, nothing is. So while we have 16 critical infrastructure sectors, we better measure them by these 55 national critical functions. And as an experiment, I tried to show the federal government that you can't treat all 55 as equal. But if you map them vertically to latency tolerance, where shutting them off for minutes or hours could lead to loss of life and mass casualties, there's only about 10 to 12 things like uh, provide medical care, things like supply drinking water, generate electricity, produce chemicals, emergency response. And these uh, command a greater level of attention than they have historically uh, incurred. And moreover, for medical, the first among equals is really provide medical care. Because if you don't have water, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have chemicals, you don't have a hospital. And, and as the hospitals further suffer from disruptions to any of those, whether it's the IT failures or industrial control systems and, and cyber physical systems failures, the resulting deaths also affect the workforce for water and wastewater, for longshoremen, for truck drivers, for chemical engineers. And these have a vicious cycle uh, that we're taking too many Americans from us. Now, one of the things in common for most of these hospitals and most of these vaccine supply chains were that they were what I call target rich, but cyber poor. They were very attracted to adversaries and they knew they'd pay, but they had very insufficient education, uh, incentives, and resources to rise to meet this new scourge of ransomware. Uh, now, there's been lots of responses in Congress. There's been lots, like, like the aforementioned Patch Act. The White House is taking this incredibly seriously. And last uh, spring, uh, President Biden in his office, the National Cyber Director, put out their national cybersecurity strategy. And five columns, the first and foremost was critical infrastructure protection, where they any of the regulators that have unused and underused regulatory authorities are, have been instructed to use them. Uh, and the, they're supposed to base them off of some CISA 
cyber performance goals. And they also have introduced the notion that for too long, software and IT have avoided liability like we have in every other world. And when public safety and public interest and the public good are at, are at risk, they're looking at shaping this with incentives and carrots and sticks. Senator Warner in the, in the Senate has put out a discussion draft that's pretty comprehensive on up to maybe three pieces of legislation to make mandatory minimums for hospitals and maybe tie Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement to them. And because 85% of the hospitals are target rich but cyber poor, Robin Kelly in the House has uh, looked at a stimulus package to maybe help them meet these minimums. So raising the bar, but also helping them. And to make this incredibly personal as we round this out and get to discussion, uh, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I'll tell you when to open them again. Uh, I want you to think of the hospital that you would take your loved ones to if uh, you needed urgent care. What's the name of it? How far away is it? Um, when was the last time you were there? Was it to welcome a new baby into the world or say goodbye to a friend? Was it when one of your kids got injured? You know, we really need to depend on these rarely, but intensely. Now, I want you to open your eyes. What if that hospital was unavailable to you? Where would you go next? Is it across the city? Is it the next town over? Is it the next county over? And what if that one is also owned by the same company and has also been affected in the blast radius, that ransom? Because several hundred times a year in counting, we are seeing disruptions at U.S. hospitals with no signs of slowing. And you may not get timely access to care. But what's worse than being down for a ransom for six to eight weeks is what really hit me in the stomach is in May and June, we came to learn that a hospital, two hospitals in Illinois, St. Margaret's nonprofits, shut their doors forever. Uh, they are not the first hospitals and small rural hospitals to shut their doors forever and not be acquired just closed shop. In fact, there have been 200 in the last five years or more, but they were the first to admit that their ransom had a contributing cause to death. So while many hospitals are on the ropes financially, I want to remind you, if you have one to four weeks cash flow on hand and you have a ransom that lasts six to 12 weeks on average, you might not be down for six to eight weeks. You might be down for, for good. And there's too many opportunities per year to see our nation's healthcare disappear. And to punctuate how serious a problem this is, this is some data on hospital rural closures over the last several years. Every one of these dots is gone to some form of closure. The, another 500 or so have been the victims of predatory acquisitions where they are bought, but they're put on life support. The good doctors are taken, the good equipment in, is taken, and the hours and services are slashed. So if you or loved ones live near one of these dots, you may have a care desert where you have to drive three to five hours to get care. And if your tolerance for heart and brain is minutes or an hour, this is going to drive and has been driving elevated mortality rates for U.S. citizens. Uh, it's starting to not feel like a very first world country and when some form of intervention is required. So on the cyber lens, which is we don't want to ignore all the other financial strains that led to this, including the pandemic. But if you uh, if you cannot, you both cannot afford to do cybersecurity and I cannot afford not to. So any of these suppliers, including those using uh, low code or no code, could be a contributing factor to these outcomes. So uh, with that, while the government's trying to turn the corner, we are sort of in a free fall, especially in this. And uh, of the 16 critical infrastructure set, healthcare has the unenvied position with regards to ransomware. I'm going to say five things. We have the longest ransoms, the largest affected area of ransoms, the most expensive ransoms and the most life safety affecting ransoms. We are the worst of all 16 on five different metrics. Uh, so in this free fall uh, for the foreseeable future, we cannot wait for the cavalry to come. Each of us play a part uh, in identifying and buying down elective risk that could lead to loss of life or even delayed degraded care for your own family. Well, that's uh, hopefully uh, listeners are having the same reaction that I had at that time and that I'm having now again, just the, you know, the, the, real world risk and concern associated with this. But I think what's what's I was making a few notes as as you were sharing the slides, one thing that comes to mind is just how everything you showed, it's rooted in people trying to care for one another. When you talk about those three S's in healthcare, you know, you've got uh, space, uh, supplies and staff, right? That that's something that the healthcare industry has come to those conclusions over the course of their you know much longer history hundreds of years of figuring out how to systematically look after patients you know you think about nursing and medicine as a 
has a care-based position, a care-based role where people are legitimately trying to help one another, legitimately trying to provide services and so forth. But then the second thing that I noticed is just the, the amount of care that you took and the other people you were working with took in analyzing these supply chains and really trying to understand the interdependencies between all of these. Never in a million years would I have made the association between cheese delivery services and uh you know, protecting my 85-year-old relatives, right? It's And it's only by this kind of deep systems thinking, looking at the whole value chain, how things are interrelated, <clears throat> including the issue of latency, right? The speed at which, uh, you know, we can respond to things. It, it it illuminates the world in a very different way. And so there's kind of people are trying to, you know, we, we want to be, you know, projecting care towards, the others that you know use our services probably try to provide some helping uh, beneficial influence in the world. But to do that, we need an incredible care of thinking, very mm-hmm. careful thinking, the analysis and so forth. And I really appreciate how you took on the burden of learning their language, learning mm-hmm. the language of these other fields and figuring out, well, including how to work through the federal government. I mean, that's, I know from our discussions in the past that that was, uh, I want to say, excruciatingly <laughs> difficult to try to, you know, work through getting some movement happening, but it happened. And even the SBOM regulations that came out recently, you had your fingerprints on those to some degree. Yeah. I don't know. Reflections on on that before we go deeper? Uh, these are the basic human needs, and they're inherently multidisciplinary. And they were, it takes a village to to make them safe. So this can't just be the security person's job or just the medical device maker's job or just the electronic medical record's job or the hospital staff's job. Every one of us uh, that contribute to that digital infrastructure, including in business and front office, you know, we these are the new attack service. And, it, and there's plural ways that uh, accidents and adversaries can compromise those. And the net result is not just, again, you know, loss of revenue, loss of a PII or PHI, you know, downtime. It's also now degraded outcomes and loss of life. So uh, I look at this as uh, both overwhelming and empowering because that means that as the world's increasingly depending on digital infrastructure, they're increasingly depending on you and you get to be a hero here. It just takes a bit of conscientious behavior from everyone in that supply chain to not be that weakest link. And and. I think that's really powerful if we take, you know, because like a lot of the things we see on the news, right? It's, we're moved by it, but what do I do? How can I help, right? It's just feels almost overwhelming. But the idea of being able to channel concern into practical actions that we can take, you know, one of the, you know, famous ones is just, you know, password security for everybody. You were mentioning a story about how, you know, a recent, uh, what the, there, there was something with a default password, a bit of uh, control oh, sure. equipment with one 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 as the default yeah. password. The uh, when I showed those the slide of water and wastewater being hacked, I was referring to Oldsmar, Florida, and some other uh, facilities in California. But uh, even recently, you may recall in the news that some water and wastewater treatment facilities in Pennsylvania were hit. Some Iranian hackers attacking Israeli companies uh, mm-hmm. hit a particular piece of equipment used, and we just learned in the last week or two it wasn't very sophisticated hacking. It had a password of one 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 one. So. Um, if you can reach out and touch someone for like stealing credit cards, that's unfortunate. When you can reach out and touch someone and shut off clean water supply or add poisonous levels of lye to the reservoir, as happened in Oldsmar, this is serious business. Yeah, tons that we can we can think about. So I, w- I wanted to take us to the second uh, part of the webinar, which is talking a little bit about security in the low code world. And yeah. I-, I was definitely uh, struck by the comparison when you talk about these you know, small regional hospitals with no security people on staff. That's, it's understandable, right? It's a specialized set of skills, you know, security people, they're hard to find often. And it's, but more to the point, it's not set forth as a priority for most organizations. It's something that we want to kind of ignore until you begin to get some of these things you mentioned about uh, liability that starts to get the attention of people who make decisions primarily uh, for financial reasons. So, you know, although some of that machinery of like, what can you be liable for and going to court and so forth, it's got this dreary bureaucratic feel to it, it actually does drive behavior. It is part of the engines that mm-hmm. that can help to to enforce behavior. We're we're operating uh, you know, I, I come from the 
Salesforce development world, as do probably most of the listeners, you know, we're operating in a different part of the different part of the economy, so to speak, where um, typically there's, you know, we're not dealing with life and death issues directly by any means. We're dealing with, but we are dealing with things like PII, personally identifiable information, and increasingly on Salesforce with PHI, personal health information. And we also have our own supply chains. We also have uh, in a sense, we're we're security poor, like you said about uh, being healthcare poor. We're security poor. Where I, it was only maybe last year that I met my first full time Salesforce security person at a company. It was a, mm-hmm. at a very very large, well funded company, but he was a dedicated Salesforce security specialist. And I'm like, really, you know, he has like a CISSP certification and. You know, because there's not that many Salesforce security specialists. And but where we sit on the supply chain, increasingly, when you you said, you know, if you can't afford to protect it, you can't afford to connect it. But increasingly, people are connecting Salesforce to the public Internet, mostly through uh, communities, Salesforce communities. And they're doing so without necessarily thinking through adequately the, um, you know, all of the security controls, this uh, Krebs report. Uh, circulated quite a lot in the spring of this year, where the original researcher had created a tool to find vulnerable sites and found something like 250 of these vulnerable Salesforce communities and tried to systematically reach out to people, but couldn't get people to respond, right? It's like an you know, unsolicited email comes in and you're like, ah, whatever. Uh, and Brian Krebs picked up this story and reached out, you know, tested and found that the DC health department was also leaking social security numbers and a lot of, you know, sensitive data for people. And so he, you know, reached out and fortunately was able to get somebody's attention. But the, this original researcher said he found, I think, 230 vulnerable sites, but he was afraid to probe too much more deeply, presumably because he was afraid of getting, you know, himself accused of trying to hack Salesforce by, I don't know, I'm going to comment on that, uh, you know, the ethical hacker's dilemma. Yeah, I mean, I think while we weren't preparing to have this, this part of the chat, I think one of the legacies of the I Am the Cavalry movement for the last 10 years is we were born in the kind of contemporaneously with probably the peak of fear of hackers, mm-hmm. especially after the Snowden leaks. And I think one of our deliberate missions was not only do we want to make the world safer, but this could be a great way to show the value of good faith hackers. Hacking is not criminal. It's magic. There's good wizards and bad wizards. You need Hermione and Harry and Gandalf to fight the darkness. And we have these legions of helpful hackers who use their powers for good to find and help you buy down elective risk. So we really help to decriminalize research to promote things like coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Part of that patch act that we passed in the law last December requires that medical devices have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, inviting hackers acting in good faith to report issues. So I think the tide is turning, but what this tells you is like the bad guys collaborate, the bad guys are acting with impunity. We want to avail ourselves of all willing allies. So whether you're writing applications for business or for healthcare or for something else, uh, you too can make sure that you can cast a wide net and uh, invite actors in good faith to report issues to you without fear. So we've done a lot to decriminalize it, to legitimize it. Every federal agency has to have one of these too. So they heart hackers, you can too. So whether you're a security researcher yourself or not, you can use things like these programs or bug bounties to give yourself a fighting chance to find things before harm. And that's that's great commentary that I think helps to sort of fill out a couple more dimensions of this story. So this, this story broke April 2023, but it was based on... Uh, a sort of publicly a published exploit by a guy named Aaron Costello. Uh, And this was October 9th, 2020, I believe. Mm. So two and a half years prior, he had published this, uh, you know, detailed analysis of how Salesforce works and how the exploitation vectors are carried out on Salesforce. So I was explaining to Josh, because he's also not a, a Salesforce expert, you know, but that Salesforce is a very different beast. They have this shared responsibility model where they do, I think, an, a very admirable job of taking care of their own infrastructure, right? So Salesforce does employ a lot of ethical hackers. They've got red teams and so forth that protect the underlying Salesforce platform. And so the risk if you're moving to Salesforce is not so much that Salesforce themselves is going to get hacked. I think that was the concern 20 years ago when everybody was first moving to the cloud and maybe more of a legitimate concern back then. But, you know, I think most of these 
companies like Salesforce, they're doing an admirable job of protecting the underlying infrastructure. But here, there is a shared responsibility model. And so Salesforce disclaims all responsibility for what you build on the Salesforce platform. And the, all of my career in the Salesforce space, 10 years, has all been about building custom stuff on top of Salesforce, right? You know, I built all kinds of things. In retrospect, how confident am I that the stuff that I built was secure that didn't have these leaks? You know, because my own, uh, you know, this was not necessarily a first class consideration uh, for the teams that I was working on, you know, make sure it's secured. But increasingly, that has to be our uh, concern to to what shared responsibility really means shared responsibility. And I think that that there, there's very few talks or things that I've ever seen compared to Josh's that really bring out the idea of what responsibility means, mm -hmm. right? Responsibility means you care, you actually care and you're stepping up to try to take responsibility. That's really the spirit of I am the cavalry. But if you're not doing that, if you're either not caring because you think it doesn't matter or you're not taking the time and care to look at what the vulnerabilities are, to look at your process, to look at where vulnerabilities might be injected and so forth, that's not shared responsibility. That is shared irresponsibility, mm. right? Mm. And that's sort of the default if you fall back to that. Josh, thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I have that phrase that we infected CISA with of uh, target rich, but cyber poor. I, I just, you know, I, I can't think, help but think that while this seminar is called, or webinar is called low code, you can have low code and high consequence. So uh, every little bit counts. All software has flaws. Some of those flaws can be used to cause harm and maybe not just, you know, but perhaps you're like me. I, I love my privacy, uh, but I'd like to be alive to enjoy it. And I think we become a nerd breach after breach of PII or PHI, and they do matter, but we've kind of gone numb to it. But if you don't also realize that the attempt to ransom those records can also affect patient care, it, it adds more gravity. It might make you lean in to the newest security alert. One thing we may get to in questions anyhow, but I'll touch on here is if this is a two-year-old known vulnerability, a lot of the White House push, a lot of the congressional push, a lot of the CISA push in response to things like solar winds or these losses of life is we're kind of defining what negligence looks like. And it may not be every vulnerability, but known exploited vulnerabilities that go unmitigated, this could be the kind of thing that could could get you into legal trouble. So, oh, we look, you pulled it right up for me. One of the things I help uh, while well, do uh, CISA is really focus them not just on the haves, but the have nots, the target rich cyber poor. And you can't just utter best practices or NIST cybersecurity frameworks to them. So I, I published a few things. One was called CISA.gov bad practices. So instead of best practices, we talked about three, including the one that just hit the water and wastewater recently, the, the default, default hard-coded passwords using unsupported legacy operating systems, et cetera. But then we said, look, people can't fix every vulnerability. There's too many. And in a given calendar, you're only 3% or so get exploited ever. But the cabs are even, the known exploited vulnerability catalog, which is now published and public and getting updated all the time, are the ones that have hit critical infrastructure. So an even smaller set. And if I were you, I would make sure I wasn't doing a CISA.gov bad practice. And I was very vigilant about known exploited vulnerabilities, both in my own code and in my third-party open source supply chain. That's the one of the reasons the White House pushed SBOM so much is maybe it's a log for j library, like we had scourged the planet two Christmases ago, it's not your code, it's still your problem. So if you're using those libraries and you're using them a year or two after the, the attacks are in the wild, you could be subject to criminal or legal liability, including more recently, the Security Exchange Commission is going hard after security lapses, especially when they're known and preventable. And the, the SEC's authority is very broad, right? I have a reporter that I like to listen to who says that uh, everything is securities fraud, right? Like anything, theoretically, if you're a public company can be reframed as securities fraud. Like you said, you had no vulnerabilities, but you have vulnerabilities, so you lied. So the SEC has an unusual amount of power. But And your investors, right? They don't want to right. see your otherwise healthy stock price destroyed because you sat on right. a three-year-old known exploited vulnerability. Right? right, right. So that, you know, it, it's... It's a lot of these things, even the way that hospitals function, you know, washing your hands. And so I take a lot of confidence. I take a lot of encouragement from the idea that washing your hands was once, you know, uh, unknown and then went through its own contra phase in the late 1800s where about a hundred years yeah a hundred year transition to try to get surgeons to systematically wash their hands right and it was sorry Semmelweis was was uh, the public health researcher who had I 
tried to put that forward and I'm reminded, I think it was Schopenhauer, right? Who said that at first a new new idea is uh, re rejected or ignored and then it's violently opposed. Uh, and then finally it's accepted as common sense, right? And there's this, this progression here. And we're trying to basically say cybersecurity is as critical as washing your hands in a yes. surgical theater. It is as critical as locking the door, you know, uh, these are things that should be just basic activity, but they've not necessarily been inculcated in everybody in society. So, yep, excellent metaphor. Well, so I want to just give time. If there's any questions that are from the audience, we have a chance to to think through those together. Okay, so there's a question from Dan Kowalski. I see here. Can you comment on the state of vulnerability scanning for non APEX? That is metadata. So that's a little bit of a technical. You know, mm -hmm. we're using some Salesforce jargon here, Apex being the Salesforce's uh, backend programming language and metadata being the other sort of click-based configuration. So vulnerability scanning, I would say, you know, I, I, I can't exactly comment on the state of the industry, but I think that that's becoming more and more recognized as critically important. It's something that uh, CodeScan, uh, an AutoRabbit uh, CodeScan has been putting a lot of energy into being able to uh, provide analysis of who has modify all data permissions in production, right? Who has view all data? Who has modify metadata permissions in production? Overprivileging. Overprivileging, right? And uh, yeah, so that's my area. Uh, not explicitly asked for in the question, but maybe a decent chance to point out uh, a lot of us. So a lot of the commercial tools for scanning are focused on where the most spending was on, you know, common languages and have ignored ERMs right. and other important and coveted targets. Historically, you've had to hire boutique consulting firms to do application analysis. And one of the things that people are hoping for, and they're very bullish and hopeful, is that AI and LLMs and whatnot can assist in, you know, code scanning for these other areas. And I too was hopeful that humans write terrible code. Maybe we can use these to help us write better code. Uh, but I've recently seen uh, four uh, peer-reviewed academic papers showing that because the models uh, for things like Copilot or ChatGPT were trained on public repos of open source where there's lots of security flaws, it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out, which I guess makes sense. But you could ask it follow-up questions like how many CWEs are here? How do I avoid you know sanit unsanitized inputs? And I think the scarier part, though, is many of the answers to those questions are invalid and incorrect. So I, I would say that while eventually we may be able to train these models to write more secure code, they are best poised for really stable, well-known knowledge domains. And cybersecurity and secure coding is not yet one of them. So if you are hoping that uh, the embrace of those will obviate the need to do some of this uh, good faith research or leveraging helpful hackers. It's not there yet. And I'm going to be vigilant about not being over-dependent on a false sense of security where it's hallucinating security instead of providing it. Not asked, yeah. but perhaps timely. Uh, I think often AI is used as a synonym for magic. Like we should <laughs> use some some AI to solve this. Oh, fantastic idea. That's exactly right. But like if we look at the history of technology, right, It's there's, there's layers, right? And the newer layers do allow... Uh, leverage, like you said, with medical devices, right? They 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 allow the doctors and nurses to leverage their capabilities yes. to care for more uh, babies and so forth in, in neonatal intensive care units. But so AI may become a very stable source. Well, it probably undoubtedly will become a very stable source of leverage, but it will still depend on some of these foundational layers, right? AI is not going to help you if you don't if you're using if you're shipping default passwords out on your devices, right? Yeah. And so the idea of being able to, if you have AI generated code, you have to be able to scan that as you're deploying it to production. For example, if you're not doing the standard security checks on code, whether it's AI generated or human generated, you're you're yeah. exposing yourself to vulnerabilities. Also, as the daddy of SBOM, I also co-chair a weekly SBOM meeting with CISA. We're going to do it later today. And a common misconception is that, well, we're cloud native SBOMs for commercial off-the-shelf software, you know, traditional. Uh, a, a, not true, but B, you're not exempt from the executive order or the regulatory, uh, the growing number of regulatory things asking for SBOMs. But in the cloud native world, you have protocols like WAC or a salsa slsa and guac that are helping to do uh, cloud native at speed software supply chain assurance for the third party open source so it's not just how overprivileged your code might be or code specific scanning but many of the vulnerabilities that ultimately give you a bad day 
or third-party open source libraries that you may not be tracking, or even third-party APIs in the cloud native environment. So um, you want to make sure you cast a wide net and avoid any elective. I mean, look, people will always die in car accidents, um, but the, a significantly smaller number after unsafe at any speed pass laws for seatbelts and other things. Uh, people will always die in hospitals. We can't save everybody, but a significantly smaller amount when we start to wash our hands more. And further, another significant amount when we avoid elective attack surface and disruption from sloppy coding in the clinical environment. So you play a small but vital role in ensuring uh, that we don't have elective disruption, elective loss of life. Whether you viewed your role that way or not, uh, you can be part of the solution. And those may be the the perfect words to end on, but are there any other final thoughts you want to offer to the low code community who's, you know, maybe hadn't had security as a first class concern mm -hmm. in their mind? But uh, my, my immediate last thought in the moment is uh, uh, many, many years ago in response to the Agile Manifesto, some of my friends and I wrote the rugged software manifesto. Mm -hmm. It's just 10, 12 lines that just say, look, uh, I'm not going to do it from heart, but uh, you can look it up at ruggedsoftware.org and the rugged DevOps community kind of embraced it too. But the idea is that, you know, we have become as dependent on, uh, we society depends on steel and concrete. You know, you don't sit in perpetual fear that your building is going to collapse upon you or the tunnel that you're driving through or the bridge that you're crossing is going to collapse. But we are becoming as dependent on software as we have steel and concrete. It's not nearly as dependable yet. So as a developer, this was a recognition that, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the code I write can be used uh, for in ways it was not intended for longer than intended, et cetera, uh, and that you should recognize that there are talented and persistent as you seek to undermine this. So when you understand the awesome responsibility that comes with writing digital infrastructure, you are more likely uh, to be conscientious about your choices of elective complexity, elective attack surface, et cetera. You don't have to be a security expert. Just understand that my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed for longer than it ever intended. So just take that to heart, like the Hippocratic Oath for Doctors. You play a part in modern society, and uh, I know you're up for the challenge. Maybe you just didn't know, but you can find out, and uh, you can help us make the world a safer place. I love it. Thank you so much, Josh. Really, really, really grateful for your time here, and so glad to have a chance to introduce you to, to our community and the work that you're doing. So um, thanks so much. Thank you.